Welcome to the Virginia Education Center for Asphalt Technology, the Asphalt Mixed Design class. And in this module, we're going to discuss the history of SuperPave in Virginia and where we're going with our mixes. My name's Trenton Clark, and I'm with the Virginia Asphalt Association. So let's talk SuperPave. It's the common mixed design approach used across the United States, and it's been in Virginia uh, for over two decades now. One of the questions that gets often asked is, why SuperPave? Why did we make an adjustment from the old Marshall system in the 90s to this new mixed design process? It's pretty simple. We were having problems with some of our mix performance. Mixes, as you can see in this picture, were rutting and flushing. We weren't getting the stability and the performance that we expected out of our asphalt mixes. And this wasn't just a problem in the uh, Virginia area and our region, but is across the country, so it became a national effort. We had some severe shear rutting, so the mixes didn't have stability. A lot of the rock that we were using didn't have the type of aggregate properties and the quality characteristics needed to make these mixes last. We also had issues with the asphalt binders. So the binders we needed to understand better and characterize better as our traffic loadings across the country and in the Commonwealth continued to increase. So again, why SuperPave? We were having issues such as this, where we didn't have structure in our asphalt mixes, and over time with loadings, over the time with uh, high traffic, you can see how we have this excessive flushing in the wheel paths. What does that create? It creates an unstable mix, but it also creates a slick mix. So imagine this in the rain, and in this picture coming down a hill, how much friction resistance wouldn't be there. So we were trying to address a couple issues with the change from Marshall to SuperPave, and we've been doing that very actively since the mid-90s. So let's go over a little background on mixes in Virginia, where we're at, and then where we're going. We evolved from the Marshall era to the SuperPave era really over a 30-year period. So through the 80s and 90s, we were doing Marshall. Starting in the mid-90s, we started looking at the SuperPave process, which was a national initiative. So we had many states being led by the Strategic Highway Research Program, federal programs, and state programs to start moving us over. For many years, we were using what was known as the S-series, surface mixes, I-mixes, B-mixes, but these were mixes that was designated really in the 80s that just said we're going to use a surface mix, an intermediate, or a binder. And then we evolved over to the SM series or the IM series or the BM series, and we would use numbers such as 1, 2, and 3. Really that had a lot to do with just the size of gradation that was being used in the mix. We would get into specifying some of the binders that would be used in the mix and really the number of Marshall blows. So the S series and the SM series, the twos, the threes, the ones, were all dealing with Marshall. And then in the late 90s, we began that transition over to the, the SM and 9.5. That's a metric unit for a 3 8 inch mix or the 12.5, a half inch mix. So over that 30 year period, you can see we went from different Marshall designs to now super paved mixed designs. Our application rates changed. So for many, many years, a lot of our overlays were thin, inch, inch and a quarter. As time went on, as we changed gradation sizes, we also changed how thick the overlays would be. So a lot of them went through an inch and a half to up to two inches. Over the last few years, we've seen some adjustments back to some thinner mixes, but that's because we've changed the size of the rock. So we're not trying to place half inch rock in one inch applications. We're actually using things like a 9.0 or a 4.75, something thinner to actually meet the needs. But over time, and it's still very common, we're using an inch and a half to two inches. So 165 pounds for most of the state is an inch and a half, the 220 pounds is relates back to a two inch overlay. Again, during the same period of time, we're changing the binders that we use, how we classify the binders, how we grade the binders, how we distinguish them. And we went through the penetration grades over to now performance grades. 
So now we're looking at how well does those mixes work in a different temperature realm from a 64, which is a 64 degrees Celsius, or 70 degrees Celsius, or 76. It really relates to the type of traffic, the type of conditions, the weight of the trucks. And we want to make sure that as those increase, they don't rut. And then the minus 22s were very common starting in the mid 90s because we wanted to make sure that at the colder temperatures and as the asphalt moves, as the pavement moves, that it would resist cracking due to low temperature. And by 2000, we had finally moved over from the Marshall era mixed design to the super pave era. Like many things, this took a few years. We started with some pilot projects, whereas today, now all of our mixes are designed pretty much based on a super pave or a tweaked super pave approach. So, if you step back and you look at where we're at in our specs, first thing that Virginia adopted was the PG binder system. That was at 6422, that's 70 minus 22. So we had a, discarded the older system of accepting asphalt binders and specifying asphalt binders. 1999, we actually started rolling out with our super paved projects. So we were doing a couple projects by district to let the districts, as well as the contractors, learn more, make some adjustments. By 20, very quickly, we went to full implementation. For some contractors, that didn't mean a whole lot of adjustments because of how their mixes were already being designed. Others, they had to make some more adjustments. Could be in the rock sources that they were using, the aggregate, that may not have met the actual quality and aggregate performance requirements. And then, as soon as we had done this, we started making changes. Just as anything, and then you move pretty quickly, you need to be able to adjust, make some things that improve, some unintended consequences needed to be adjusted. And right out of the bat, we found a lot of our mixes were dry. When we say a dry mix, it just doesn't have enough liquid asphalt in it. When it doesn't have enough liquid asphalt in it, it doesn't have a whole lot of life. You don't have your aggregate properties properly coated. So it's very subject to oxidation or the mix getting hard due to air, due to oxygen. It also has a uh, small thickness of asphalt on the rock, so it could be also uh, subject to stripping. So we saw right off the bat, they were dry, they were coarse. So you can meet the mixed design requirements in super pave. One way to do it is to use a lot of larger rock. What that does is it reduces your demand for asphalt. In exchange for that, the cost of the product goes down. However, we saw we had field permeability problems. We had density problems. So while these mixes met the specification, they weren't necessarily the mixes that the owner wanted to have produced. So again, adjustments began pretty much right out of the bat when we're saying, we don't want that. So what did some things we do? Well, initially it had what was called a restricted zone. All that means is we didn't want any aggregate gradations in this area, so we tossed it out. Because we saw from looking at past performance data and history that we had well-performing mixes that had gradations in this area, so we immediately dropped it. We also went from the initial super paved specs had a multitude of gyration levels for compaction. That gyration level was really a set or is a function of how much traffic, how heavy the traffic would be, the number of trucks. So it had a whole range. What we saw very quickly was that led to very dry mixes, very coarse mixes. The initial thought in Virginia was we were going to do it at 75 gyrations for our higher level, 65 gyrations at the other traffic levels, and really even before we got into implementing it, the 75 was dropped because we saw what the impacts were on asphalt content. We wanted to keep the asphalt contents up. We didn't want the mixes to be as coarse. So we got rid of that and we immediately went to one gyration level. And we were one of the leading states to do that all the way since about 2000. As I mentioned with the gyration levels, higher gyration made a coarser mix, 
so it wouldn't rut. So for truck traffic loadings, however, Virginia took a different approach. Instead of adjusting gyration levels and adjusting the gradations, we went with different binders. So as the demand on a route or a pavement increased, so did the binder that we needed. So a standard binder in Virginia in 2000, 2001 was a 64 minus 22. If we're doing work out on a higher volume primary or out on an interstate, it was very common to go up to the 76 minus 22, which was a polymer modified binder, to again use that as a way to address the heavier truck traffic and the heavier loadings than going to a higher gyration level. And then very early we eliminated the BM 37.5. This is an inch and a half mix. It was very coarse. I had low asphalt contents. It was uh, prone to segregate during production and even during uh, compact or lay down. So because we saw the problems associated with that, right off the bat within the first couple years of SuperPave, we eliminated the BM 37 and a half. What are some other things we've done? So here we are almost 20 years later, following the lead from the state of Florida, we put in permeability requirements on our surface mixes as another check to make sure we had a good gradation in the material to withstand water. If we get the compaction, the water shouldn't go through it, so we should get better longer life. So we added a perm spec. We put a minimum AC content on our BM mixes. The reason we did that is because we wanted to make sure that the gradations weren't adjusted to hit the volume metrics but we had that asphalt content in there as well to make sure that the aggregate was coated for better performance. We changed our design VTM. So we went from 4%, which was the standard design approach, down to 2.5%, again, as another way to adjust gradation, as well as to improve the amount of asphalt that was in these mixes. We started allowing more wrap to be introduced. For a long time, Virginia was a heavy wrap use state. A lot of our mixes had 30, 40% wrap. When SuperPave came on, that pretty much dropped everybody back down to 20. Over time, doing some research, doing some cost analysis, we were able to put that wrap percentage up to 25% before any binder change, allowing up to 30% wrap with a binder change. So that was a very significant adjustment. And then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we actually added two more mixes, a 9-0 and a 4-7-5. Again, so we can go, it's a finer gradation, we can put it in thinner lifts, it makes for a very good preventive maintenance. It also works as a very good surface on new construction. Think of subdivisions, localities, where you have a lot of car traffic. These are two very good mixes for either new construction or preventive maintenance. Over the last five years, we've seen even more adjustments really over on the binder side. So for many years, from about 1996, 1997, up until just a few years ago, we were going with just the PG binder system. And because we had an elastic recovery test, we were known as a PG plus state. So we had the standard high temperature, low temperature, but then we also added a percent recover, elastic recovery on our binders to make sure really where we're asking for polymer modification, enough polymers had been added to give us that elasticity. Uh, but we changed that just a few years ago where we went into the massacre system. It's another way to classify binders. The goal there from a national perspective, if an asphalt supplier is supplying to six different states, it was very common for all six states to have a different way to approve a binder. The masker approach was to try to unify those so that one supplier could do one set of tests that could work in all six states. Some other things that we've done through this is we had to change how we classified them. So the old system of the 6422 and the 7022 and the 7622 Still very common vernacular, you hear those same words being used over and over. But now, we call it a 64S, a 64H, and a 64E. The S is just 
standard traffic, H is heavier traffic, and the E is for extremely heavy traffic. What does that really mean in the end? It relates back to these old binders that people were still comfortable with of using the terms for 15, 20 years, but it really just went into how it was tested in the lab to make sure it met certain requirements under the masker test. So we have changed. We still use a lot of our A, D, E terms when we're specifying a mix. So nothing really changed from that standpoint, but it is going back to how the binders are actually tested and classified. We also had some changes in the surface mixes. We reduced design gyrations in our surface mixes, and we've also now reduced them in our intermediate and base. So we've went from a 65 gyration state down to a 50 gyrations for compaction. Came through a lot of research done over several years to see what could be done to improve the performance of the asphalt mixes. How could we get some more asphalt into these mixes? We reduced the number or the air void content to three and a half from 4% for these E mixes. So those that are 64 E minus 22s again to try to get a little bit more binder into them as well. We've changed the minimums on our voids and mineral aggregate. Again, from a mixed design standpoint, as you'll see in other modules, how that adjusts, what the specs are, how they're met. We've adjusted things such as VFA as well and F, uh, FA. So that's been adjusted. And we also own our surface mixes for the 9.5 and 12.5 put in some more gradation restrictions to try to make sure we have a good aggregate structure to accommodate putting more asphalt in. So those are some pretty big changes over the last four to five years. And again, a quest to improve their overall performance. We had good performing mixes. We want even better performing mixes. What are some initial outcomes overall? So across all the mixes, produced in the state with these changes over the last few years. We have seen a modest increase, it's a 0.2% overall. Some mixes it really didn't impact because of how they were already designed. Some it made some pretty significant impacts. But the goal again was to get a little bit more liquid in these mixes so they perform better. The lab research is still being done and really for some of these we have lab tests and we have lab performance tests but a lot of it is Let's see how they actually perform over time. So some of these take years to actually monitor. And as we're monitoring, just like everything, we're continuing to adjust. Some big changes that were, were put in 2019. As I'd mentioned before, we made changes with our surface mixes several years ago. In 2019, the change was to adopt lower design gyrations for the IM and the BMs. So we went to 50 gyrations as well. So we took them from 65 down to 50. Again, the goal of get even more liquid binder into these mixes. We increased our minimum volumetric requirements on our 19 millimeter. So with those changes, we adjusted the VMA to get a little bit more liquid in it. And you'll learn more about that in other modules. We adjusted things such as VFA. And then as you can see here, our FA ratio or our fines the asphalt, our effective asphalt, we made adjustments there. So while we were making adjustments a few years ago on our surface mixes, in 2019, we made adjustments. And here you can see a couple samples. This actually is a specialty mix from a project where it's the base mix, the 25 millimeter, but it has even more liquid binder in it. So in an effort to make it very uh, fatigue resistant, this mix, this BM25 high modulus high binder was created. Again, looking at our revised specs, and here you can see a, a nice core out of one of those roads. So where are we going now? superpave has been here for 20 years. Prior to that, we had about 20 years of Marshall mix design. What's the next step? Well, first thing, you'll hear the term balanced mix design. Sometimes it's called performance-based mix design, but Balanced mix design is the top ARAC or the Asphalt Research Advisory Committee project. We're taking it in that next step. And now instead of designing to AC content gradation volumetrics, 
we're actually going to performance. What do you want? What does this specifier, what does the owner want from in terms of performance of an asphalt mix? So that's, again, just as we've done other changes through the years, it's taken research, pilot projects, implementations, evaluations, but as we're going through, we're trying to identify exactly which mixed performance test we want because there's plenty of them out there. The big ones that you're always looking at is what's the best cracking test, what's the best rutting test. A lot of that goes back to what the state needs. If you're in Wisconsin, cold weather cracking is a big issue. If you're in Virginia, Florida, it may be another mode of cracking. So how can you best test for that to make sure your tests won't, or your uh, materials won't crack? We also continue to want to expand the use of recycled materials, use rejuvenators. Asphalt's very sustainable now. It's almost 100% recycled. So how do we continue to use roads that are in place, materials that's already been paid for, back into the next generation of roads? So that's looking at how we use the recycled materials. How do we put rejuvenators in there to put some life back in that older binder? And as we talk recycled materials, there'll be other things as we go down the road, whether it's plastics or reevaluation of glass or other byproducts or waste products from other streams. Can they be incorporated into it at the end of the day, though, to provide performance? If they don't meet the performance criteria, then can they be adjusted or should they not be used in future asphalt mixes? So with that, if you have any questions, reach out to the facilitator, the subject matter expert in your class. If you're in a live facility, ask questions. But thank you very much and good luck in the asphalt mix design class.